Hello, welcome. It's Thursday. No, it's not. It's Tuesday. We kind of mixed that, didn't we? We, start, we started off in Thursday for like two years. And now it's Tuesdays. Don't know how that happened. Sorry. It's Tuesday. Welcome, everyone. Everyone that's online already. Um, so, I'm Paul. You know that, kind of, because you're watching this. And we're going to spend the next hour editing in that piece of software, Capture One. That's their logo. Um, Capture One being the raw editor that allows us to take our photographs or the raw data from the photographs that we take, mix it up a bit, do some processing online, hopefully make it better, hopefully make it back to exactly what we saw, because sometimes the raw data in a camera doesn't quite match um, always what our eyes believe that was there, um, and then allows us to export that out as a finished image um, for you to all enjoy. So you guys have been sending us images in to edit. Um, we're not going to edit my images today. We're going to edit yours, just like we always do. And this is a live session. So for those of you that are live today, please engage, play, challenge, question, um, comment, feel free. Um, you've got the chat function there to do it. There is a slight delay on the chat, as always. So when you type something, if I don't respond straight away, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It just may not have arrived on my screen right now. Or actually, here's the weird one in your head. I'm actually ahead of you by about 10 to 12 seconds, something like that. So I'm in the future right now, and you're not. Well, you will have caught up in a bit. Yeah, it gets very confusing. But anyway, what you type, I will see, just not quite yet. So for everyone that is used to us um, in our live editing session, I'm not going to repeat too much of what we normally do. But what I am going to start with is the current version. So there is a latest, latest version out. Um, it, see, it seems like every one of these live sessions we do, there's a new version um, that we have to download. Um, it may be because we used to do them weekly, so we didn't notice it so much. But um, certainly there's been a, a series of updates, um, the latest one being 16.1.1. So if you go into Capture One, it's Capture One 23, meaning 2023. But if you go into Capture One and go to About, you will see that box up there, just there. And that will give you your version number or a build number. Today, we're going to be editing with 16.1.1. If you're editing, if you're using anything that is 16 point something, you will probably be just fine following along. And for that matter, anything generally 15 point something, so Capture One 22, you're also probably OK. Anything earlier than that, you might find I'm referring to tools and, and features that you may not have access to. So either download the free trial. You can use the latest version for free for 30 days. Everyone can do that. Or update your software. Um, or if you don't have it, go get the software. But start with the free trial. Always use the freebie first. If you're on a subscription, uh, you'll find it in your account. So just go to the account section on capture1.com. If you bought a perpetual license, you may need to pay to upgrade depending on the version that you're coming from, but that'll also be in your account and you can check that out. So that's the admin done. Um, please interact, make sure you're on current version and let's, no, we're not gonna get started. I forgot, we are gonna talk about one thing next week. Um, so for those of you that have been around for a while, you know that we have masterclasses. So these are, set topics, um, 90 minutes interactive for those that are joining live, but available afterwards as well um, as, a, as a set masterclass. So we've covered them on black and white conversion, on golden hour, on cityscapes and so on. And we are doing a new one next week. So next Tuesday, which is the 21st of March. Um, that's this one, color grading and styles. Now, a bit more in depth than what that sounds like. <coughs> so excuse me. Um, we're going to talk about color grading for landscape and cityscape photography specifically. So a lot of people believe, I think, that color grading is the sort of the realm of the fashion, the portrait photographer and, and advertising photography. And it is. If you don't know how to color grade, you're going to struggle in that um, in that realm. But color grading is also how you get your look, your style, your feel when you're producing your landscape images or your cities. So when someone looks at an image and says, ah, that looks like it was taken by someone, um, some of it is in camera work for sure, but a lot of it is down to the grading in the edit. So yeah, hopefully um, we're, in a, we're in a good place um, of being able to teach you guys how to get a grade that looks really, really specific to you, really exciting, um, and, and actually starts to form your style. And more importantly in Capture One, we can save it out as a style and apply it to future um, images. Michael, you just said an update to the Feb 21 session is being on there. No, 
Um, I don't understand. If we mean the February 21st, there is no... I don't know. Sorry, Michael. Um, you might have to explain that one a little bit because um, I'm not exactly sure uh, where that's what that's referring to. But anyway, let me know. Um, but this one is 21st of March, um, if it's the masterclass. Um, right. For today's session, we are going to go into Capture One. So here is our Capture One session, or catalog in this case, because we're using catalogs. And these are your images. Before we do that, um, I'm actually going to cover off something that Paul, the last minute request, how cool is that? So Paul just mentioned about um, struggling with Helicon. So Helicon, for those of you that don't know, is a focus stacking assistance software. So when you are talking about focus stacking, what we're talking about is if you're shooting things with a huge depth of field, you don't really want to be shooting at the smallest possible aperture, even though that will give you a massive depth of field because you're going to bring in diffraction, you're going to bring in softness to your image, and your lens will have a sweet spot. But here's the problem, that sweet spot, let's say it's at f8. When I'm close to this tree, for example, and I also have this tree far away, I want them both in focus, but at f8, as we can see here, it's not possible. So what happens is we start stopping down, and we start to get to f22 and stuff like that, and even then it might not be that our depth of field is big enough because our, our distances are too great or the difference is too great between the nearest subject and the furthest. So you end up in a horrible place where it doesn't feel like you can do it, but that's where focus stacking comes in. So what focus stacking means is we take one slice of a depth of field near to us, then a further away, then further away, then further away, and you end up with, just like here, a load of different images. And if we look, the focus point on these images is shifting with each one. So this one is in focus here, this one is not. At the beginning of that stack, this one is in focus, this one is not. So I've got all of this focus in all these different images, but I want to blend it together. And Capture One doesn't allow you to do that natively inside the app. What it does is it has a plugin um, that it works quite nicely with called Helicon. And Helicon Focus allows us to stack all these together blend them together and deliver back one final image. Now, Paul's question or challenge was, when I put it into Helicon, it sort of disappears. So we're just going to cover the round trip. I'm not going to go into detail in, in terms of Helicon use, but when we're using an external editor of which Helicon is one, this is the way that it actually works. So we're going to right click on our images that we want to use. So I've selected them all and we go to export. In fact, I'm going to do it here so that you can see my menu. Um, now, typically when we want to get an image out into a TIFF, we'd go to export and we start exporting with all those settings. The export dialog box comes up and it says, what do you want? Do you want a 16-bit or an 8-bit TIFF? Do you want a JPEG? Where do you want to put it? Is there a recipe name? All this stuff. Um, oh, Paul has just said, can we show it with a focus mask? We can, if you wish. Um, let's have a look. In fact, I don't even have my focus mask up on my thingy. So let's add that onto my toolbar. So again, any tool that you're missing, right click, customize toolbar, you can add it on there. So I click the focus mask. This one is focused most strongly, bear in mind I haven't set my thresholds, most strongly here, the green bits. This one, a bit further away. This one, midpoint here. This one, no, I, I disagree, but okay, so it's picked up on those bits. And then this one is actually the furthest bits out in the far distance. So that green highlight is showing you that these all have very different focal points with the same aperture, same exposure, same everything. Camera didn't move. We've just moved where it's focusing. There you go, Paula. Your wish is my command. So let's um, let's have a look then at here. So typically, as I say, we'd go to export and we'd export our TIFFs and then we'd go into another application and use it. If I don't want to take any edits, and this is a, a thing to bear in mind, I would use OpenWith. And what OpenWith does is it takes the literal file, pushes it to the external application, allows you to change things and then save it back. So for example, if I already had a TIFF exported and it was sat in the catalog, if I don't want to apply any new adjustments, I just want to take the TIFF as it is and open it in, let's say, Photoshop or Affinity. I can do that. But it's this one that's important, edit with. 
So what edit with does, it's a bit of a blend between open with and export. So if I go edit with stack in Helicon focus, it's going to give me some choices. So do I want to keep the processed variants? In other words, to do the focus stack, it's got to create these TIFF files, or I'm going to do it in JPEG actually, just for, for speed. But it's going to create five JPEG files, one for each file. Do we want to keep those variants? Or do we just want to give them to Helicon? And then they can be discarded later on because all I want is the final output. And that's the case. So I don't want to keep these. In this case here, please don't do this. We're just doing it for, for ease. But we're going to do it as a JPEG, Adobe RGB, fine, 300 DPI. The reason is these are 151 megapixel images. And I just want to not take too much time on this. What metadata you want to take out, any cropping or sharpening or anything like that. So I've got my five variants selected. I've gone right click, edit with, not open with and go to now edit variants. So it's going to prepare those images. How exciting. And then well, what should we talk about for 30 seconds? Um, we could talk about pot noodles, but I, f I fear that's a very dead end conversation. Um, however, Prasad, there we go. Color grading masterclass, the one I asked for in the group. Um, so yes, it was directly because of you asking Prasad. It's your private personal uh, masterclass you must attend um, even if you are flying over the ocean at the time um, so we are going to load why well, it's going to now load up helicon tony to your question um, no so we're edit with so export push the file out separately open with edit the file as it is edit with and there's an important reason for it but we'll come back to that in a second now your screen is going to look very, very confused because that window opened massively there. Let's just move that comment. So here is my Helicon Focus. So very simply, there are some steps that we can do in Helicon, but in this case, I'm just going to choose well, method B or whatever, um, and I'm going to go to render. So render is going to create what's called a depth map. And it works out where the sharpest parts of every image is. And you can already see, so this is now starting to to look pretty good we can retouch so what we can do is we can erase bits from different images um, we can see what bits on our source map it has taken from each of those different files so you can see the slices that helicon has actually used all very interesting um, but at the end of the day we don't want the slices we want the final image we can actually export it as a 3d um, model which is kind of fun but for this case I can either hit save or even if I close Helicon, doesn't really matter. And we're going to save that there as a TIFF and I can choose the file type. Fine. The reason we've used edit with and not open with is edit with keeps track of what this application's doing in the background and capture one keeps an eye on it. So as I come out of Helicon, you'll see here, bingo, is my TIFF file. And it sat in the same folder, it sat in the same catalog, it sat next to actually um, the, the images that were there already. If I put my viewer on, so I've now got the original files, you know, front tree clear, back tree blurry, middle clear, front blurry, back blurry, um, back really clear, front really blurry. And then I've got my Helicon TIFF, so the combined file that Helicon's just worked on, sent back and we can see the entire image from this tree in the background, to this tree in the foreground is 100% sharp. And that's what focus stacking is. So when you see these impossible shots um, where they've got a huge depth of field, but everything looks really, really small or, or close, it's probably been done with focus stacking. Um, and more likely than not, it's probably gone through a tool like Helicon Focus. And that's because it's one of the best ones out there. There's a reason that Capture One doesn't do it internally, and that's because right now Helicon just does it better um, than, than most other people can. So it's there as a plugin. If you don't see it as a plugin, if you go into your settings, you should be able to see that you've got a Helicon Focus plugin that's installed. You need to go to their website to install the plugin that integrates Helicon Focus, the app, with Capture One, the app, and then it's this plugin that does it um, in between. If you don't have this, your interactivity is going to be degraded significantly. Um, and if you don't go to edit with, you're not going to be able to do um, some of that with the automatic placement of the output in your catalog. 
So that's for Helicon. It applies to all the other applications as well. If I wanted to do the same with Photoshop, I'd right click, go to edit with Photoshop. The saved file that comes out of Photoshop will sit in my catalog exactly where I was before while it's waiting for me. So Paul, I'm hoping, in fact, I don't even know if Paul is online. If he's not, oh, but there's your, there's your question answered. Um, we'll go on to editing, but if anyone's got any questions about the things with plugins and how edit with versus open with versus um, export and whatever works, just put them into the chat here or comments and we'll try and cover them because I know a lot of people struggle with this stuff. Right. Normally, this point, 15 minutes in, I'm still talking about other stuff, but we actually got into Capture One really quickly, so that's exciting. Um, so this one from Chris, uh, the question was, can we get more detail into this annotated area? So the first thing I want to talk about is annotations. Um, because a lot of people don't actually know that you could do this stuff, um, which is kind of kind of interesting. So your annotations, depending on your workspace, and interestingly, because I did a update, I'm missing a couple of tabs. So if ever your tabs go missing along here, you can add the tool tabs, or you can go to Window, Workspace, and you will find your previous backed up workspace. So I'll apply that one. There we go. Um, so that's my original workspace back in place. Um, but you can always add a tab, don't worry, you can click on these little three dots, add a tool tab, and, and add one if it's missing. The one I was looking for is... Uh, where did I move it? That's the other question, it's probably on the metadata still. Okay, so if you're looking for the default position for annotations, it's under this one, the little I, which is your metadata tab. Um, Anthony, how do I find a list of apps that can be edited with Capture One? To be honest... I'm not entirely sure. There used to be um, some stuff in the support site for Capture One that sort of covered it. I mean, certainly, if an app supports it, they typically tend to talk about it quite a lot, um, which is kind of good. Um, but I'm not sure there is a definitive list, to be honest. It'd be very difficult to keep in or keep track of it because if, as long as the the app developer has got the SDK to be able to do it. Um, they could write one without Capture One even knowing, in, in theory, I guess. Um, but there are quite a few. Um, so, annotations. They sit here. You can choose your color, which is most important, because if you're dealing with a load of black and white images, you might not want a white annotation thing. Um, you can choose your brush size and so on. And this is the stuff that when we're talking about things like Capture One Live, so the ability to share, this is where people get excited about, well, can I start sending annotations and stuff? And that's where, you know, people asking for the development roadmap and whatever, you know, how quickly could we get annotations in and, and things like that. Um, because this is the way that we communicate with people, either ourselves, this is the thing I want to come back to, or someone else, a retoucher, this is the thing I'm talking about. Or it could even be customer or client or viewer saying, no, I don't like this bit on my arm, or I want to remove this bench or, or whatever. But the annotations I can draw, I can start making little angry arrows saying fix that. Sorry, Chris, I am ruining your picture. Um, and you can set your annotations so that when you go to another tool, they disappear. So they only appear if you press the I key or go to annotations. Or you can set it to always display them. Um, so I've just turned that off, but that's how to do it. Um... Oh, there we go, David. So David's on. Um, pretty much anything can plug in. Um, you just add it the apps in the preference pane. Yeah, so you can add in any app that you've installed that behaves nicely. I've seen some that don't go in very nicely, very well. Um, but generally speaking, if you want to see it appear in that edit with list, you've just got to add it in. Um, is it possible to deselect all checkboxes at once in copy and apply the dialog box? Ah. That's a good question, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I've never tried it, to be honest. Um, oh, sorry, where are we at? Styles tab. We want. Um, I don't think you can in the adjustments clipboard. Uh, uh, yes, you can. Sorry, there we go. Under the, the three dots. Ah, cool. So, um, so Tim, oh, sorry, that was your question. Um, in the adjustments clipboard, um, so it's slightly different to having the button up here, but the adjustments clipboard is the same thing. It chooses what you've got copied and what you've got applied. Little three dots, you can go to select all or select none 
all selects adjusted. With the default, remember, is always to select adjusted. It will only choose the items that you have made a change to. But in there, you can select all, all the ticks. You can select none, um, all go away and it all collapses. It's a bit, a bit odd. Or you can go to select adjusted, um, which then goes back to the default behavior, which is copying the stuff that has been changed. So yeah, I, th I think that's what you're asking, hopefully. Um, so annotations, this is how we add them in. If you want to erase them, pretty easy. You just click on the area that you want to get rid of. Um, you only have to click once. But a lot of photographers you'll find have got this sort of hidden layer in all of their images, which are the annotations. And they're the bits that are really useful when you want to come back to an image after, you know, a couple of days. Or, you know, when you're doing like, um, let's say you're doing dust spot fixing and you get to a point. Well, draw a line as an annotation down there. Say, you know, say to yourself, I got to this point or I've done that bit and I haven't done this bit. It means that when I come back tomorrow, there it is waiting for me. Um, and you know, as I say, if you want them to display always, just put that little preference on. If not, they will disappear when you choose another tool. So Chris rather handily annotated this and said, this area, I want more detail. So let's create a clone of that variant. Um, and let's have a little look into here. So the first thing I want to know, so yes, we can use all the sliders that the world can provide. Um, but in reality, so there are a few layers in this, this shot, but the base layer, um, which isn't the same as background. So Chris has done a base layer that if I press the mask button, you'll see everything is filled. That's allowing us to do global adjustments. We've got contrast up. Now that may be a challenge here, and we'll talk about that in a second. I'll expand the histogram. Um, but we've got shadows lifted to 44. That's quite a heavy shadow lift or lift. So what I want to see without any of these other sliders is, is there data in there? Now, if I go to the before, I would say that looks pretty crushed um, in terms of data in there. It looks pretty flat, but let's have a look. So I'm going to go to, in fact, we'll leave it as before and after so I can see, was there data before we played with it? And is there still data in there now? And let's just pull up exposure. Now, I'm not too concerned about the state of this image because it's only temporary. I just want to see whether there's stuff in there. But by pulling up exposure, I'm not worrying about a few things because all I want to know is, is there data? It might be that Capture One sees this bit of the tree here not as a shadow. You see where the orange bar is up here on my histogram? That's the area that, that this sits in, in terms of luminosity from 0 to 255. So it may be that if I pull up the shadow, it's not enough to really uh, make that appear. It may be that something that I think is a highlight, like this part of the tree here, that's pretty bright, but actually no, it's sat in the shadow. So I could be using the wrong tools to try and find out whether something's got data or not. The easiest tool is just exposure. If I want to see if a highlight, like this cloud has got data in, pull the exposure down. Yes, it does. Loads of texture. Wonderful. If I want to see if these trees have got data in, just pull the exposure up. Don't play around with all these other sliders if we're just trying to establish whether it's possible to pull this up. And in this case, it is. The challenge being, let me just uh, get rid of that. Let's go into here. Let's look at these layers. We've got a base layer, which has got contrast pulled up, and we've got shadow pulled up. We've got a mountain layer where Interestingly, shadows pulled down, but highlights is pulled down as well. Blacks is pulled down. So let's think about that in a second. Got a heel layer. Well, that's nothing to do with really um, brightening areas. You've got the deep sky style brush, which is on certain places, and that's been used to make the clouds pop with a bit of clarity. And then you've got a burn area here. So this area here is ironically, again, darkened. So if we want to get detail in this, Darkening the very, very darkest parts possibly isn't our best um, way to do it. Now, there's a few things. If you think about the sandwiching of all of those changes, let's, let's just think about it. We're darkening here the exposure. On our mountain layer, we're pulling down black. So black being the darkest parts of the histogram by minus 18. On the base layer, we're leaving that as it is, but we're pushing contrast up. And on the background, it's left alone. So what's that doing? Well, contrast 
isn't going to help us with any dark areas to make them more visible because what it does is it takes your histogram imagine sort of drawing a pyramid in the middle of it or a line in the middle and saying right we're going to push anything that's that side get brighter anything that's this side get darker it's not quite that simple it uses a, a sort of curve um, approach to do it so it ramps up the brightness and it ramps down the darkness so it doesn't really just sort of linearly just say right brighter and darker it, it's a bit more intelligent than that but the net result, regardless, is that the dark areas of this image, when you put contrast up, will get darker. That's what contrast does. So this being positive, uh, interestingly, you've got a shadow of plus 44. That's probably battling against this contrast of 29. If I turned this off, you'd see how much lighter that gets. Turn it on again. OK. Turn the shadow recovery off that's what contrast actually did to this image so that much contrast that's a lot of contrast dialed in on that dial or that slider when you put that much contrast in you are going to have to recover some stuff so i'd be in a place of rather than playing recovery let's just back away that contrast just a little bit that also then allows us to back away the shadow recovery a little bit too we might want to pull up the black a touch now this is the base layer that's across the entire image there was also this mountain layer and that's just around the mountain now from what i can work out it looks like chris has probably used refine mask so that's one of our favorite tools at the month at the moment um, but the refine mask tool allows us to let capture one make decisions on whether it can spread to trees and branches and bushes and clouds and whatever and make a very very detailed intricate mask that is natural looking when you make a change so we've got a natural mask a really what nicely done mask around the mountain itself and i'm in a place where there's not enough clarity in here if you want this to really pop we're going to use clarity to do it there is a little lightening of the darkest parts of the image through this curve there's also a pullback or a darkening of the highlights in this curve so again if i temporarily undo it we see that's quite flat. This has got a little bit more, it seems like there's a bit more texture in there. And that's this sort of raking. The midtones have been pulled up and the highlights have been pulled down. So you've got a little bit of, um, of texture added in there. But where it's going to come into its own is in clarity. So clarity being a effectively a midtone form of contrast or dynamic contrast. Um, and it's looking for edges and shapes and textures and structures. And it then enhances them. So let's pull up clarity in this one here. And I can see, you might not see it quite on YouTube, but I can see there's a subtle distinction now. It started getting um, some distinctions between the darks and the really dark parts, and it's actually pushing them down a little bit. So as a result, what I'd then be tempted to do, having done that, we've, we've pushed a load more contrast into this. We can lift it up using brightness. There's a reason for not using exposure. So I've pushed contrast into this shot, that contrast makes the darks darker, the lights lighter. If I use exposure and push it to the right or to the left, those light lights are at risk of overexposing. The dark darks are at risk of underexposing if I go the other way. Brightness is like a more ramped or subtle version of this. So if I use brightness to do it, let's go back into those trees. Let's just show you, actually. If I do exposure, it, flat, it, it flatly brings it up. If I use brightness, it's a bit more subtle. It doesn't quite push the bright parts as bright. This is going to allow us then to even push a bit more structure into there as well and get a bit more texture going on, maybe even a bit more contrast with, um, with more clarity. We wouldn't normally use that much clarity, but in this case, it can take it because it's, it's a really um, detailed image. Dehaze. Now think about this. Your base image is still color. So this is a black and white conversion. It's been done over here on this tab here, enable black and white. And Chris has chosen to make the greens and the cyans darker. So pull them to the left, make the blues, the magentas, the red lighter. So push them to the right. So that's how we sort of split the, uh, the tones within the black and white conversion. But what there is still is a residual blue here, which is the mist. So even though we're in black and white, we still have a shadow tone. And what that allows me to do is to push dehaze a little bit and get rid of the haze from that shadow tone. So let's just choose 
that bit there, a slightly lighter blue. And we can now see, so if I go do temporarily just without and with, without, with. So we've now got more detail in here. It's slightly lighter, but it's kept the contrast because we've added in clarity. We've kept that curve where it is. We've dehazed or got rid of that wash of blue. And you've got a bit more structure in there while lifting the whole thing up. So ironically, we took away that big contrast slider because that slider is a very brutal thing. It's a darks get darker, lights get lighter. Clarity is more in the mid-tones, which is where this stuff sort of sits and it, it separates out a little bit more. So then we go from this one up here to this one down here. I'm not sure whether your YouTube screen is going to show it enough, but we'll try and maybe get a, a JPEG or something out of this so you can see. But the detail in the darkest parts of the image have started to come out. Um, and if I look at out here, this is the original. This is the new. And this new one, you can see there's a lot more texture going on in these mountains. Um, so certainly along here, it just feels, I'm just checking on that monitor to make sure it looks the same. This feels like there's more texture, there's more objects in that forest, uh, more trees and so on. There's a, is that a bird there or something? I'm not sure. Maybe it's a building. Um, but this is all done through contrast. It's just contrast adjustments. And the, the takeaway from this is just be careful. When you do contrast adjustments like this, it, it's made the dark areas so dark because that contrast slider was so heavily used. And what that's done is it's taken anything that you can see in the histogram was already dark and it's pushed it off that left-hand side. This edit down here, while it looks relatively the same, you can actually see more detail in here because we've got some of that contrast. We've flattened some of the big contrast down and we've added in micro contrast, so the dynamic contrast the clarity gives you. Okay, um, let's have a look at Knoll's image. So I remember this one from last week. Huh. Cool sunrise, sunset. I don't know which one. So, one thing to bear in mind, um, and it's a bit of a gotcha for a, a lot of people, I think it catches them out. We always ask you guys to send us an EIP. Um, that allows us to see the raw file with the edits that are already attached. So if I take, for example, Chris's shot here, you'll see it's, it's got this funny file extension EIP. If I right click and go to, in fact, let me just get it on the screen, right click, export. The way to get an EIP, just as a reminder, is to export the original files. You will get this dialog box come up and there's a tick box, pack as EIP, and that means include adjustments. What that means is when we get the file or your retoucher or someone else using Capture One, they get a package rather than just the raw. So it's the raw file plus all the masks that you've drawn, all the layers, all the adjustments, and it's all wrapped up in this file called an EIP. If you just send us the raw file, we literally get the raw. Nothing that you can show us that you've already done or any challenges that you've got. So the problem is when I make changes to something like a TIFF, by the way, uh, just a little fun, we've got a few fun ones today. Um, to make your browser big and no big viewer, press the G button, press the G button to get it back. That's literally the same as going down here and turning that off. But if ever that you're a bit you know, fed up of scrolling up and down in your film strip to try and find something, whether it's along the bottom or on the right, it, either way, um, if you press the G button, you fill your screen with your browser, um, which can be a lot, lot easier sometimes. So this TIFF file, even though there are adjustments made, and let's have a look at the original here. So that's the, the raw. This is the one with adjustments. There's no way, because it's a TIFF, there's no way that Noel can send me the adjustments because when I go to export the original file, even though it will say, yeah, do you want to pack it as an EIP? Yeah, that's okay, that's fine. Let's just click on edit, oh, export, and it's going to say export failed. No files were exported. If you do a batch and you include a load of EIPs, or sorry, a load of raw files and a couple of TIFFs, you'll also get this. But if you go to the log, you'll see that it's only the TIFF files that it's not exported as an EIP. You can only export that as a TIFF or another file format. So the downside is we can't see what Noel did. <laughs> um, but the upside is I've got the raw. Yay. So we can start from scratch. If I were to look at this picture here and in terms of what I would do differently, the problem that I see here is this sun is very yellow, very yellow. Um, and I know that the light is probably warm, 
but it feels like that sun has been taken in isolation and made really yellow um, and it doesn't quite match the rest of the scene if it were quite at that level of saturation and if I look at the raw you know there is obviously yellow in there and there's yellow tones in here but it just feels like it's been taken a bit too far now the reason it's a TIFF is possibly because it's been taken to an external editor. The reason for that is because we have a slightly wonky horizon. You can see on here, I don't know whether this was handheld, null, or, or whether it's um, just a <clears throat> ultra wide, well it's 10 millimeter lens, but maybe that's having an issue. But overall, there's a reason why it's been taken out of Capture One, and that was probably to try and straighten this. I would love a straightening tool. Um, but we don't have it at the moment. We do have the ability to do our distortion, which kind of straightens sometimes, but it doesn't really. If we go to generic pin cushion, we can go the other way. Um, but I think, in fact, that sort of does it. But we're in a weird, yeah, we're in a weird place there. So I'm not going to fix the uh, the geometric distortion on this shot. It's kind of a caveat. We'd have to take that out somewhere else to just bend that horizon back to straight. But what we can do is edit the rest of it. So the first thing, obviously, is just remove any distractions. So let's go down and get rid of... That's another camera there. You were there with someone else. Hmm. Careful with that. Um, we, we find that quite a lot, actually, when people are shooting. Um, quite often you end up with someone else's camera or tripod legs. They're the words. There's, I see them here. But um, yeah, the odd stray tripod leg is one of the most annoying things ever. Um, so there's our shot. It's close enough to where we were here. It just needs a bit of, let's say, the bend fixing later on. So there is a challenge here, which is our lens profile didn't load in. Um, but our camera profile did. And the curve here set to auto well we could play potentially with linear response instead and i'll show you why so our auto curve if i look at our histogram we've got a load of stuff here in the dark areas we can see that it's you know there's lots of underexposed areas in here this is interestingly a, a potential for an hdr shot the problem is if you want to do hdr and a panorama um, at the moment you can't quite do that in capture one in one go but you know maybe that's in the future we'll see um, but as it stands, this would be a, a suitable candidate for HDR because you've got bright brights, dark darks, so you want to blend them together and get something a little more dynamic out of it. We don't have that option because it was a panorama, but if I look at the sun here, I do have, and I can check it just like I, I did at the very beginning. So if I want to check something, I don't need to play with tools, I just want to play with exposure. Is there detail in the highlights? Well, there's not here, but that kind of makes sense. It's the sun, it's really bright. There's some cloud here that's dropped some detail. We can see that as well. Um, so no matter what I do, and this is this is the reason why we do it with exposure. If I can't pull it back with four stops of exposure, the highlight and white tool don't have a, a chance. The levels tool does not have a chance. The curves tool does not have a chance. If it's blown out after four stops of recovery of exposure, which is a flat change to the histogram, there's no more data in here. So we've got a little bit of loss, but it's generally where the sun is. Okay. What about the shadow? So let's take inside here. Whenever you're shooting something that's got a door, use the inside um, to measure the shadow issue. Pull the exposure up. Now, there is stuff in here. Is that a refrigerator or something? Um, but I can even see the wooden rafters you know, going across um, from the inside. So we've got a lot of detail and a lot of data in the shadows. We've also got most of the highlights recovered, apart from the bits that would obviously be the brightest. So we know that we can recover this shot. The problem is that with the auto curve, so if I go into our color tab under base characteristics, this auto curve, which is actually the same curve as film standard, that's, that's what it is. Um, that means that our histogram automatically has like an S curve built into it. So it's pushing the highlights, it's pulling the shadows, it's giving us a bit of a pop. So if I change that curve to be linear response, that removes that addition of the S-curve pop. And what that does is it flattens out. So if I look at our histogram up here, let's just do that again, film standard, linear response, film standard, linear response. 
So linear response, because most of this image is sitting in the shadows, it's flattening down all that contrast in the shadows. And you would be worried normally, apart from the fact that I've already checked that we've got data in the shadow. So by switching to linear response, we've softened the impact of the sun here. We've reduced the impact of that glow. And I can now go into... Sorry, right, I'm just going to allow Keith to publicly apologize for being late. There we go. Um, we, we can now use our exposure or our shadow recovery or our black recovery or the curve. Doesn't really matter which one in this case. Let's go for shadow to pull up all of that data and all that detail in the darkest parts. We could use black as well separately. Be careful with this. Don't do it that level. You see this is horrible. Oof, don't do that. The problem with doing this is you see how we're bunching all of the data into the middle. That means we're removing all contrast, all contrast whatsoever. Um, so as I do this and this and this and this, you see all the data sits there. I now have a boring image. There's no contrast left in it. So we don't want to do that. We do, however, want to lift up some shadow, lift up a tiny bit of black. Now, because I know that I've got as much of the data out of this light hotspot already, I'm going to recover it and pull down whites. And there's a reason for that, because overall, remember, I want to keep contrast. If I just use the HDR sliders, I risk flattening down that contrast. So overall, I want to lighten the image. Best way of doing that is with the exposure. If I pull the exposure slider too much to the right, then I'm going to blow out this area that I've just switched to linear response to try and help. So by using the highlight and white protection, by now pulling up exposure, I'm able to pull up the exposure of the image without it going into this weird cartoon place where everything is flattened, there's no contrast, there's no texture, there's no depth to it. So this, if, if we think it's still too much, well, we can pull it down a little bit in exposure. That's okay. We could use brightness instead, which is a slightly more soft, um, like we said, a ramped version of exposure. So now I've got this, I want to play probably with our white balance and just make sure it feels like a sunrise or sunset. So probably going to warm it up a little bit, probably going to degreen the tint a little bit. And then in Noel's image here, we've got this sort of blue tone here and that I, I, I struggle with it a little bit. If this is so warm as light, then you'd expect these clouds, the undersides of these clouds, to, to have picked up some of that warmth if it was that yellow. Um, I'd expect these cloud tops here, these little white bits here, to also have picked up some of that warmth if it was that warm. So I just want to be careful that we're not overdoing that. So let's go into here and put on a new gradient mask. We are going to make the clouds a bit more emphasized, but we're going to do it through clarity to make it pop. Uh, a little bit of structure, and be careful with structure, because at ISO 400 we might introduce a little bit of grain, but it's looking okay. And we could drop the white balance a touch. I wouldn't do it this far. I would stop probably around there. Um, we can push that tint a little bit as well. That's okay. So, oh, by the way, just a reminder from last week. Remember I did all this stuff on the background layer? Very bad. Shouldn't do that on the background layer because I can't reduce it or increase it. As of 16.1, move background adjustments to a new layer. Remember what it does. It doesn't copy them to a new layer. It literally cancels them off of the background where it can. Noise reduction, black and white conversion are stuck on a background layer. But move them to a new layer. We'll call this base. We'll call this clouds. And what that's done is it's moved every adjustment I made off of the background layer and onto a new layer. Big change from 16.1. <laughs> so uh, I was going to come on to that, but Paul has got there as well. So what are the spots above the farm? It looks like looks like a dust spot that's been repeated in the stitch. But what doesn't quite make sense is there are three stitches and they wouldn't be quite that close together. However, um, they're kind of unwanted. They're kind of distracting. Um, so Paul, if, if the point was, can we get rid of them? Yes, I agree we should do. Um, so I'm just going to do that. In fact, let's just check whether Noel left a bin. No. So I'm assuming then that they weren't meant to be there. So we're just going to use a rough healing brush. It doesn't really need to be 
that specific. Let's just get rid of that bit. Okay, so dots are gone. Now, that's our cloud with texture, great. Let's do a new gradient and we'll call it on a new layer, we we'll call it foreground. I'm conscious we probably need to get rid of this tripod because if Paul has spotted the three dots, that's probably driving her nuts. Um, let's get rid of that and get rid of that. That bit there is struggling. So that's kind of got it there. Good. Okay. So on my foreground layer, remember as well also, if you've got a heel layer already, going back to the healing brush will automatically select that existing heel layer unless you create a new one. Um, so back to our foreground layer, we have at the moment no mask on it. So I'm going to create a gradient mask that goes from here up to there. And again, I'm going to use exposure. I'm not going to use um, any other tool like you know the shadow tool or anything like that. We're going to use exposure because I want to darken everything equally leading up to it. Just seen this little gap here. In a pixel editor, you'd content aware fill that gap out, but because we don't have it here or we're not going to go into that here, I'm just going to crop that out. So that gets us to sort of a base edit place. Now, what could you do with this from there? Well, let's just create a new clone of that variant. If I were to take um, Noel's existing version, I could create a new layer, call it edits, and I could take our saturation and kind of boost it. That's starting to feel a bit like, um, a bit like where we were. We could potentially pull down some shadow as well, just to make it a little darker. Could pull up some clarity. And you can see we're going, we're going very much in the direction of, of Noel's original edit, but without that real yellow, yellow glow. Um, we need to go, um, you know, this just feels more natural as a sun. Um, Tim, if I bring an image up to 300%, it becomes very blocky on a 30 megapixel camera. Um, it, because it is blocky. Um, if I do the same here, um, so where are we at? Let's go to 100% and then zoom in again to 200. We can see it's blocky here at 300. It's blocky. In, in fact, there's ghosting in there, Noel. We'll talk about that later. Um, but yes, it is, it's going to be blocky because it, it can't invent pixels. You know, it, this isn't a blow up tool in that sense. Um, it's, it's literally taking that pixel and it, let's imagine I go to 400%. Every pixel that I had is now, what's that, quadrupled um, in size on my screen. So yeah, the closer I get, the blockier it's going to be um, and it's not going to interpolate for you. So things like Photoshop, things like um, Topaz and whatever will interpolate the image for the viewer so that you're seeing pixels that aren't really there. It's sort of filling in the gaps. Capture One's not designed to do that. It's designed to take your pixels at your raw data level and display them. If you want to display them bigger than one pixel's worth, you're going to see that blocking, um, I'm afraid. If it's blocking and it it's difficult to describe. If it doesn't look right, so if it doesn't look like this and you're actually seeing blocks, you know, full on heavy blocks, just check one thing, which is your preview size. So under your image, just make sure you've got a high enough preview um, in there. Um, it shouldn't matter. Once you go beyond, once you go into 100% and beyond, Capture One is actually displaying to you the raw itself. I just wonder if. Now, could it be that the screen is bigger than the image? Unlikely, um, unless you're on a very big screen. Um, but maybe it's to do with your preview size. But yeah, the, the blockiness is is kind of part and parcel of, of having to upscale an image. Now, this sort of image here, there is some benefit to going old school a little bit with a vignette. And what I would be tempted to, this is a, a thing that fits on the background layer. So... If I had moved this onto that new layer I created, the vignetting would still sit on the background layer. You'll see as I go through all my layers, the vignetting stays there. It's because vignette is one of those um, tools that only applies to background. Our foreground. <clears throat> now, if I want this to feel a bit more golden, what I could do as a final sort of touch would be to take the greens or to be really specific, let's take the uh, advanced tool click on this slice because it's not quite green, it's sort of yellowy green. And we're going to push that hue and it can go more green, as you can see, or more golden, more yellow. 
I want to expand the area that it's covering. And remember, because it's on the foreground layer, it's only this bit that we're including. So if I want to expand the area of the foreground layer and, and that's being affected by this color change, what I'd have to do is take our gradient mask and shift it up. So that now has more of an effect. If I now go to our um, wheel, I can now effectively make it more lush and green, or I can make it more warm um, and reactive to that sun. We could do the same with the barn. You know, let's just create a very, very quick version of that. So brand new layer, brush. In fact, we use a magic brush. Let's see what it can do. So reasonable size, quite a decent tolerance. Let's just see what Capture One thinks it's got. Yep, good. So I'm just going to click a few times to get the whole barn covered. There. If you're playing with light and the color of the light, make sure you get the entire object in, otherwise it looks a bit odd um, when one part of the shed is a different or barn is a different color to um, do everything else. But let's, um, let's include that and include that. Remember I mentioned about Refine Mask? Right click, Refine Mask, and we can start expanding it to cover more of the barn. That looks pretty good. Hit Apply. And now with the barn, we can now independently take the warmth of that barn up and maybe kill off some of the green in there as well. So then our barn goes from there to there. Let's just zoom in so you can see it more. Let's just push it a bit more there. So it goes from there, kind of bluey green, to there, a little more warm, a little more reactive to the tone that we're seeing come from that sunlight. So that's where I would leave it. Now, obviously, <clears throat> Pixel Editor um, would allow us, and, and in here, I think Noel sort of cropped it out, but, you know, we could get rid of this little, um, I guess, um, what is it, gazebo thing or, or shed thing or whatever. Um, but, you know, that's a job. You could try it with a healing brush, but it's going to be better in a Pixel Editor with Content Aware Fill. Um, but that's where I'd go. I'd stop short of here. This just, and if I look at these now side by side, this one feels so much more natural as a as a view. It, I'm guessing it probably more matched what you saw than this one. This green tint on here on the barn where the saturation has been pushed up too much. The yellow of the sun is a real distracting sort of feature to it. Um, and if I look at, let's just reset that. Uh, oh no, let's, let's not reset the crop actually. <laughs> um, let's just get rid of all of these layers. So if I look at the original, let's just pull it up so we can see it. There's our original. That would be the edit I push it to at most. And even that, oh, I'm looking at that sky and thinking, oh, it's gone a bit a bit too tinted. I might even be tempted to pull down the saturation on the sky to keep it grey or greyer. Um, maybe a bit of warmth coming from that sun. So yeah, there's our original. There's our edit. I think that just pushes it a bit too much. Um, Michael, am I going crazy or are the clouds replaced with the blue sky in the original edit? I don't think they were replaced. I think what's happened is um, there's a there's a shift, either a color editor or a white balance shift. Um, you know, we, we could recreate it. You're just going to literally, I'm going to do it badly just to be quick. Um, but we could you know, take this area of cloud here. And as I say, bear in mind, we're doing it badly intentionally. Um, but I can cool that right down. There we go. And we get some we get some sort of blue tint in there. We could probably go to the color editor then and say, right, anything that is blue, let's whack up the saturation, pull down the lightness. And I get a blue area. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. I, th I think this is fine. This is a nice shot. <clears throat> it's a nice sunrise. Um, I wouldn't push it too far. Okay. Um, Ian, this is a very cool shot. Um, and I don't think we've we've looked at any of these properly. So I think between this week and, and next time, um, we're going to cover a few of these, especially this one. Um, but let's pick on this uh, for a start. So this is the raw file. And actually, there's something for you. This is the raw file that's not been touched, edited, anything like that. How cool is that picture? Um, yeah, loving that. 
Um, at 5.6, 200, I'm, I'm glad you were 250 millimeters worth of lens away because this one looks like a road crash about to happen if you weren't. Um, but at, at that, at 5.6, there's probably some challenges with depth of field. You know, up here looks a bit sharper. I think you're probably focused here. As they come nearer to you, you're losing a bit of sharpness. Don't try and focus stack moving animals. So going back to what we started with, um, please um, don't <laughs> don't try and do that. But um, you know, maybe shooting at less than 5.6 might have been a good idea. What I would do potentially is up the ISO, get to 250 or 320, and that would allow you up to sort of 7.1 or 8, which would give you a much much deeper depth of field for it. But that said, this is incredible as a capture um, from that time. So what could we do um, to make it you know, really pop? Well, again, we, we sort of touched on it. It's contrast. Look here. A lot of this is sat in the middle. Now, if we want the fog and the mist and everything like that, that's wonderful. But just as a quick adjustment, if I were to pull that, so our bright areas there and our dark areas there, maybe we even pull our midpoint on the levels. So if we go before and after, you see how we're getting definition now inside of those. Now this bit here is maybe a bit too bright, so I'm just going to back that away a little bit. But again, clarity. It's a mid-tone adjustment. So it's going to affect all of these little light rays, all these little bits of dust and particles and stuff. Clarity is what's going to grab those and boost them. So if you really want to, you know, push that fog, it almost, you know, dehaze allows us to clean fog. Clarity allows the contents of what was in the fog to really stand out through contrast. So using the two together, if I were to click a shadow tone to remove, which is this sort of gray area here, push our clarity up, push our structure up a little bit, you know, we go to a, you know, that's really cool. But this has got a lot more texture now in it um, and a lot more detail. You may not like that. Um, it may not work for you. You might want to get back to um, the darker or the, the, the more foggy areas around. Now, here's the downside. Of course, I've done all this on the background. Ah, not a problem now. Right click, move it all to a new layer. Um, call it base edits. And with that new layer, which is fully masked because it's a filled layer that it creates, well, of course, I can start erasing. So I'll go to my normal eraser. And we're just going to erase out some of the areas around the edges to soften them. So now I've got a mask, and you'll see here, I'm just pulling back some of the mask. So I want all this contrast and, and clarity and stuff to really affect the animals in there, but I don't want it to affect any of the foliage on the outside. Don't want that to be a distraction or that. So that's looking pretty good now. And now I've got a layer that I can turn on or off or change the opacity for. So we can back it away. But I mean, yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure I'd change too much of this one. Um, yes, we can add styles to it. Um, yes, we can adjust levels. Yes, we can put a curve in there so we can we can add a bit more um, contrast. But again, don't push it too much. We could go into our split tone, so we could maybe cool down those shadows and warm up those highlights. That gives us a nice sort of morning glow to it. That's kind of cool. Again, I'm on the base layer. So the, the layer that I created called base, which means it's affecting the middle more than it is the outside. Um, but that then goes from there to there. You know, which one do I prefer? Arguably the top one that I've just edited, but not much more than that. Um, it looks um, it looks pretty good out of the camera, you know, almost to the point where this one is maybe a bit too much um, on that color edit. We might want to pull those highlights and mid tones back to be a bit more neutral. But that's where I would go with it. Um, the rest of it is up to you. Would I add a vignette? Possibly. Um, but you know, it, the risk is all this work we've done here. You're losing. Do you really need the vignette to pull the focus onto these guys? Absolutely not. Um, so I'd, I'd be going there. Um, Anthony, apart from this edit, how do I copy the contrast of one tone curve to another curve? Um, well, you're, yeah, but you're, you're, what you're referring to, I think, um, Anthony, is 
your base curve here. Um, and if you shot on a Fuji, which I think Knowles is, so I can show you, you've got in here um, your Astia and you've got your Provia. You can't copy them from one to the other. You just go to the other image and you'd apply that base curve. Um, because that curve, while it does apply into here, actually into here in the RGB, um, it's not one that you can access. It actually changes the underlying values are slightly different. So um, if you're talking about the Fujifilm curves, um, you just need to apply the right one to the right image. You can't copy and paste um, that underlying curve from it. If you've created a curve manually, um, so I've got one here, I'll just show you um, a dust spot finder. Um, so in my curve here, if I go onto here, sorry, and put in my, well, we call it rainbow splat. So that's my weird funky curve. Um, if I'd created this, or let's just edit it there, I can save that as a custom preset, and then I can pull up that curve again. Um, so let's get that comment off so you can see it. So click on the three little um, lines. You can save that curve as a custom preset, and you could then apply it to any other um, image that's in Capture One. But that's a personal manual curve that you've created. That's not the same um, as the base characteristics curve, which is sat here on your ICC profile. Right, uh, I think that's it for today. So um, we've got Noel's farmhouse. We've got Ian's very cool, I think they're they wildebeest. I always get animals confused um, or bison or something with horns. Anyway, don't want to be in the way of it. Um, and then um, Chris's uh, mountain thing. But to go back to where we really started, um, it's this one. So plugins, if your plugins aren't working properly, try a reinstall. If not, then contact support for either the plugin manufacturer or Capture One, both should be able to help you, hopefully, if there's an issue in there. Um, that's us for now. We'll see you next month for the next one of these live ones. If you are joining the Color Grading Masterclass, please register before the 21st of March. Um, you can always watch it after. You can always register afterwards, but you'll be watching the replay rather than the live session. Um, so between now and either next week or next month, look after yourselves. Send in images, um, please do. Um, just send them into the uploads um, area, so paulreeferlive.wetransfer.com. Please include your name. If you can, include the EIP like we talked about, um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can next time. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.